All right, so today we'll be doing something called a naive base um, classifier. Um, since, since the previous lessons, we've been talking about classification. We dealt with um, linear um, regression and logistic regression. So today we will deal with um, naive base classifier. So let me, let me move to that page and then we can actually see. Okay, so um, before before we we start today's lesson, um, is there anything about the projects any one of you want to discuss? Is there anything about the previous projects that you want to discuss? I've given um, I've given the web scraping um, projects and also stats projects. And then the linear regression projects. And uh, I've seen some of you submitting and um, it's good. We will discuss some of the submissions and uh, some of the things that was suspected. And uh, you, 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 you did a good job. And there's, um, there's one or two things that you need to do. I've, I've gone through, I mean, those who have submitted, I've gone through it. And there are one or, one or two things that um, you still can add. Okay. So um, we will talk about naive base today. I will, after this, I will, I will upload the logistic regression projects. I did not upload because we already have about three pending that we've not actually touched on. So I decided not to add that. But after today's class, I'll add that because naive base classifier is also having a project. And um, I mean, the more you do, the more I can add to some of the projects and we can also discuss, right? But since um, if we put the project there and uh, you, don't, you don't submit, then it means that I cannot continue adding more, all right? So some, I mean, those who have submitted have gone through it. Uh, if you have not submitted yet, please do and then submit it, okay? All right, so um, if you remember the start class, if you remember the start class, we talk uh, about the naive base theorem where we did some calculations and uh, we, we also talked about independent events and then we did some calculations and we came up with some formula. All right, let me bring my pen on so that I can at least write on the screen for you to see. If you remember, uh, we did, if we, we, we talked about a formula like this one. Let me try and write this. Okay, so um, guys, tell me if you can see my pen on the screen. If you can see my pen on the screen, let me know. If you cannot see, let me know so that I can um, actually adjust it. Is it visible? You can see, right? All right. Is uh, someone talking? Uh, if, if your microphone is on, please mute yourself. If you have something to say, let me know. Uh, if your mic is on, please mute yourself so that you will not be giving us um, the feedback from your side. Okay. All right. So um, in, in, in the start class, we talked about a formula like this. This is actually a bracket. So let me do that clearly so that you get to see it. All right. Well, um, we say that the probability of A, I mean, the probability of B happening, given that B, A has already happened, all right? Probability of B occurring, given that A has already occurred, all right? Multiply by the probability of A, divided by the probability of B, all right? So this is what, this is the probability that we have at hand, all right? 
this is the probability that we have at hand. This is the information that we have at hand, right? So we call this, um, we call this prior, right? This is the prior information that we have, right? Prior just means that before, right? This is what we already have. So this will be equal to the probability that the probability of A happening given that B has already um, happened, all right? And this, this is what this is what we call the um, the base theorem, right? This is what we call the base theorem. So basically, this is what we want to arrive at, right? This is this is what is referred to as the posterior, right? The posterior. This is what we want to arrive at. The probability that A will happen, given that B has already happened, all right? And then this is giving us the probability of B happening given that A has already happened, multiplied by the probability of A divided by the probability of B. All right. So basically what this base theorem is actually doing is extending the conditional probability. If you, if you know a little bit about conditional probability, the probability of say um, something happening, right? So the probability of say, um, going out right the probability of going out let me say go out all right given that there's a lockdown all right so this is a conditional probability and this is what base theorem is actually basing on all right this is it's nothing but this this is just something like that so um what base theorem is trying to do is that you already have some information at hand all right, so in our case, the information that we have at hand is that there's a lockdown. All right, so now if if we ask what is the probability of you going going out, that will be maybe less, right? So that will, that is actually a conditional probability. There's a condition here, and then we try to um, satisfy this this probability. All right, let me go to um, let me try and bring one note. Maybe that will be better. Let's go to this. I'm going to bring my one note. Okay. I'm going to bring a new one, new page. All right, so um, <clears throat> as I said, we have the conditional probability, right? The probability of say A given B, all right? The probability of A given B. Now what this one is saying that, is saying is that, let's say you want to go out and buy something, right? You want to go out, or maybe you want to go to the office to work, all right? So um, the probability of you going to the office, right? So let me do like this, go, go to office. Yeah. Right. We have the probability of you going to office. Okay. Now, base theorem will come with a new information. This is the information you have at hand. All right. This is the information that you have right now. So, what base theorem is trying to do is that if you have a given information, how can you adjust that information, given a new one coming in? All right. So, let's say we have another. Um, condition here, right? Lockdown. So now there's a lockdown, right? So now this is what you don't know right now, okay? So let me do this. This this one you don't know, but this this one you know. You want to go to the office, right? Let's say before um, the lockdown was announced, you 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 have a plan to go to the office the next day, and then there's information that there's a lockdown. Now, previously, your, 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 your probability is you going to the office. So if we ask you, what is the probability of you going to the office? Maybe you will say 0 0.9, right? Very, very high. There's a very high probability of you going to the office, all right? However, if um, this information comes in that there's a lockdown, right? So now if we ask you, what is the probability of you going to the office the next day? Maybe it will drop down to maybe 0 0.1 or maybe 0 0.001, maybe very, very less, 
all right? And this probability will drop down because of the new information that has come in, all right? Because of this new information that has come in. And that is what base theorem actually based on, all right? So if, if um, and this, this is actually very, very applicable when we talk about um, classifying an email as spam or not. And that is what Google actually used that you have given, you have setting, I uh, mean, um, word, right? Okay, you want to classify the email as a spam, all right, giving certain ways, okay, giving certain ways, all right, Th and this is what Google based on to classify an email as a spam or not, okay, so there's probability of certain ways happening, okay, and then there's a probability of spam, probability of a spam email. Now, how do you determine that an email is a spam or not, right? So in that case, we just um, give it like this, all right? Just probability of an email being spam, giving certain words, all right? So maybe these words could be um, something like um, win, maybe win, or maybe, um, Congratulations. All right, maybe um, the email was coming with some words like congratulations, or maybe um, lottery. All right, so these are words that, that would be defined by Google, right? Words like um, lottery, like win, like um, lucky. All right, like maybe spin and win, something like that. Maybe spin and win. These are some of the ways, right? That maybe um, Google will say, okay, if you see these kind of words, right, then classify it as spam. So in this case, it will be like this. The email will be spam, all right? If any of these words, right, if any of these words are present here, all right? So if there's maybe lucky, this email will be spam. If this word appears, lucky or appear, then it will be spam. Or maybe um, another word like um, spin and win. All right. Maybe something like that, spin and win. It's in the email. Then it will straight away be classified as spam. And it will go straight to the spam folder. All right. It will go straight to the spam folder. All right, so the um, naive base classifier, right? The naive base classifier is actually used for this kind of purposes. All right, we already have some ways, right? We already have some ways, or we already have our email, all right? The email is written with some ways. Now, if these ways come in, if we edit, we see any of these ways in the emails that we are, that if we are sending, right? Then it should be classified as spam or no spam, right, if it is not present, okay? So uh, one thing you have to note, right, one thing you have to note is that when you're giving um, a problem statement, right, you're giving a problem statement. Now we, we, we are talking about, I mean, several algorithms which um, we've talked about linear uh, regression, we've talked about logistic regression, and today we are talking about naive base. Now we're going to talk about a lot of them. We're going to talk about um, in quite a lot of them to lies of support vector machine and um, k nearest neighbor and k means and uh, this right. What what you can do to actually identify which algorithm to use or I mean which which um, model to build is first you have to know your target right. You have to know your understand your problem statement. All right, you have to first understand your problem statement. Okay, so if you understand the problem statement, then you first, you again identify whether this problem statement is a regression problem. All right, whether it's a regression, a regression problem or it's a um, classification problem. Or it's a classification problem or it's a clustering problem. All right, or maybe to go through some kind of reinforcement, right? Where well, we, we also touch about it somewhere later on. All right, so basically that's what you need to know. Now, 
if if you remember the last week our problem statement that we dealt with we want to classify something as um let me let me break it down in this way so that it will be simple for you let's say you have a and then you have b all right now if you have a problem statement where you need to classify or you need to identify something as a all right or you need to identify something as b then it's a classification problem all right it's a classification problem so if your problem statement comes in a way that you, you need to identify something as a or b then it becomes a classification problem for example when um you need to identify an email right you need to identify an email as spam or not spam all right so you can think of this spam as a you can think of not spam as b right this becomes a classification problem other or you can also um, think about maybe you want to um, classify a customer as defaulting on a loan or not all right so default on a loan right like not paying a loan back or not default on a loan that is um, the customer will pay back something like that all right so in this case you can think of this as a you can think of this as b okay this becomes classification it becomes a classification problem okay um it can go beyond a and b to say c or d something like that right for instance um you want to classify items into uh, according to their ratings right so the ratings could be um, zero rating or one or two or three or five maybe on a scale of zero to five people are giving different different ratings all right so you can also classify items according to their ratings all right that becomes also a classification problem however if the problem statement is like predict say stock market in the next five years all right in that case that's a regression all right you need something that will help you to predict in the next five years that becomes a regression problem let's say we give some um some attributes or some condition here right can you build an algorithm so this line just think of it as an algorithm can you build an algorithm that if we have any condition or any attribute coming in we can trace on your algorithm and then make some predictions of the stock price all right and trace and then predict the stock price this becomes a regression this becomes a regression problem okay now um or maybe you want to predict the gdp i mean the gdp of a country right of the next maybe two years or three years based on the information that you have this becomes a regression problem so for regression problem you can use what is called the linear regression right you can use what is called the linear regression or the logistic regression okay and uh if if it is classification then you can use any of these you can use the naive base to do that all right and i will show you some of them also here let me let me complete the, the clustering then i will show you some of them let's say you have um you have some customers that come to your website right so if customers come to your website let's say um some of them come they buy say apple right they buy apple products some buy apple products some buy say samsung products all right some buy apple some buy samsung uh, maybe some buy a plus i mean one plus Oh, come on. Okay. Maybe some buy one plus. All right. Maybe, uh, what one again can we add? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So maybe, um, customers come and then they buy Apple products, right? So maybe someone came and then bought a laptop, Apple laptop. All right. 
And then someone came and then bought, say, um, Samsung phone. And then maybe someone came and then bought, say, um, OnePlus charger. All right. Now, if a um, different customer comes, right? So let's say customer one. Let's say customer one. Let me change this. Yeah. Let's say customer one, right? Customer one came and then bought this. Then um, customer two bought this. Customer three came and then bought that, right? Now, let's say a new customer comes and then that customer say customer four, right? Also bought um, not, not a laptop, maybe iPhone, right? The person bought an iPhone. And then another customer comes, um, let's say customer five, okay? The person also bought Samsung laptop, all right? Then another customer comes and then uh, let's say customer six comes and then that customer bought um, OnePlus phone. All right, now you see what is happening here, right? There are some, some customers who like OnePlus, okay? And there are some customers who also, um, who also like Samsung. And there are some customers who also like Apple. All right, so this become clusters, all right? This maybe cluster one. Now what you're doing here is that you're grouping, you're grouping these customers, right? According to what they like or according to what they have in, I mean, in common, all right? According to their similarities, you're grouping them. All right, so this become a clustering problem. All right, so we have several clustering, I mean, algorithms that you can use for this and I'm going to show you in a minute. All right, so when you have problem first, identify what that problem is, all right? Then after identifying what that problem is, you can know which algorithm to use. Um, the other algorithms that we have left, we will go through I mean, the concept behind it and then get to understand it. But basically, they will all come together um, after learning the concept and everything. When you get the problem, you might be using three or four in just a single problem. You might be using three or four different algorithms to get to know which one is performing better according to, I mean, their final score, all right? So, I mean, not that you learn one algorithm and you can just stick to the algorithm or be using it to solve a particular problem or something like that. After learning all the algorithms, you'll be using maybe three or four in a single problem, and then you check the accuracy score and how they are doing. And then maybe you can also do some hyperparameter tuning, and then, I mean, it boosted the performance of some of them, and you choose the one which is performing better for you. All right, so that's what you're supposed to do before actually doing any kind of, um, any kind of um, building, any kind of algorithm. Okay, so um, let's let me let me let me show you this one. Let me show you this one here that I have. Okay, now if you see this one, right? I I intentionally um, group them into this kind of um, supervised and then unsupervised here. All right, so that um, maybe later you can refer to which one you get when you get the problem the problem statement before you, you can easily refer to it and make reference. All right, so if you can see over here, we have a linear regression. So if your problem is, um, if your problem is a regression problem, like I said, you are predicting something, all right, um, like stock price or something like that, right? Then it becomes a regression problem and then you use regression algorithm. You can use either of these, all right? And if um, it is it is classification problem, like I said, you're classifying something into maybe A or B or C or something like that, then you can use some classification um, algorithms, right? You can use some classification algorithms to do that, all right? And if it is clustering, you can use um, the K-means or the, um, the high dimension reduction. I mean, we will talk about, we will talk about this and then you can also talk about um, hierarchical, right? And then you can also use um, PCA, okay? So basically that is, that is how you actually approach the problem. So in a single problem, you might be using, maybe it's a regression problem, you might be using um, some of these. And there's, there's some others that is not here, which 
Um, later on, I will also introduce you to the lives of decision trees, right? I will, I will also introduce you to all those all those ones, right? We have we have others which are not here. Some of some algorithms which we will be trying, like the SG boost, all right, and the light boost and those stuff. We will be trying all of them. But basically, that's what you're supposed to do. Identify your problem, know what kind of problem it is, and identify which algorithms you're going to use. All right, if there is a regression problem and you, you start with um, using classification problem, then you're actually going to have a big problem and your results is not actually something that you would like. All right. So um, is there any question here? Okay, so regression, I mean, um, naive base is basically based on the base theorem, as I said earlier on, and uh, um, it's, it's, part of, it's, part of the, um, it's part of the classification algorithms. Okay, so um, we, will, we will choose a classification problem and then we will see how we are going to use the naive base to work on that. Okay, now if we go to the documents, I mean, the documentary, right, which you I mean, I recommend maybe you might be referring to it always and always, but I mean, as a start, it's, it's good if you can spend some time and then um, read, go through and then see how um, things over here are, are being represented over here. So this is, this is just, this is the same thing that I was telling you over there. This, this equation is what I broke it down for you, right? That's the probability of say A given B, right? At first, if you see this one, it might be something which, which is um, tedious for you, but it's just, it's just the same as this one. So the probability of A given B is this what you want to find. Now you start from what you have already, right? You start from what you have already. And basically it's nothing but just switching this. Let me bring it, um, let me bring it forward a bit so that you can see. So the probability of say um, a given b all right it's nothing but the probability of b given a multiplied by the probability of a divided by the probability of b that is what it is doing over here all right that's what it's doing over here okay so if you see it over here just represent it with simple terms like this and you get to understand it all right so, and uh, as I said, when you are building the algorithm or you're doing uh, this machine learning stuff, you are not actually going to calculate anything over there. All right, this is for you to get to understand um, the reason behind what you're doing, but actually you are not going to do any calculations over there. These, all these are inbuilt, all right? They are, they've already been inbuilt. So when you're using the algorithm, all these have been taken care of and you don't need to work it by hand, all right? Um, naive, one thing, what naive base is actually based on the Gaussian distribution. If you remember the Gaussian distribution, is um, nothing but the normal distribution, all right? So it makes assumption that whatever you're going to deal with, like if you're dealing with A and then B, like um, you want to go out, right? You want to go out, you want to go out versus, um, versus lockdown, all right? What's, what's naive base is assuming here, right? It's assuming here is that going out and then um, lockdown has nothing to do with each other, right? Each, each one can happen without the other. You can go out and then um, the lockdown can also happen, all right? Although there's lockdown, but you can still go out and buy some stuff, isn't it? So what, that's what um, um, naive base is actually assuming. So sometimes you might come across that term parametric. All right, so what this basically saying is that it's based on assumption, right? And um, that's one disadvantage of it because um, sometimes it might use this assumption and you might get, I mean, low accuracy or you might actually have wrong predictions. That's why you need to use maybe two or three algorithms before coming to a conclusion, all right? So it's actually based on the assumption that whatever you're going to use your training data so this will represent your training data all right this will represent your training data and this training data um, naive base will assume that they are independent all right they're independent of each other 
that is the assumption it will make, and that is why uh, sometimes it's being called a parametric um, algorithm. All right. So let's let's go to the notebook and see how these things are, are being used. Okay, so we are going to use a data set which, um, which is called the Pima Indians Diabetes data set, right? It's available on Cargo. So um, if you go to Cargo, you will get to, you get to find it over there. All right, so we are going to use that. We're going to use that. So the first thing we will do over here is to import our library, all right? Import the necessary libraries that we are going to need, okay? So we start with uh, importing um, NumPy as NP, and then Pandas as PD, and uh, we also import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT so that we can make some um, some visualizations. And then we will use matplotlib inline so that we can plot all our uh, visualizations inside the Jupyter Notebook. And then we also need uh, Seaborn as NSX so that um, we can make interactive visualizations, which is, I mean, easier to plot, considering, I mean, in comparative with Matplotlib, and it's actually built on top of Matplotlib. So we use it together. So let's load our data set over here. All right, so we'll do um, pd.read underscore CSV, and then we read this. So if you download it from um, Cargo, you have it in this form in a CSV format. So you can easily, you can easily um, read it with the read underscore CSV, all right? Then we will store it in DF. DF becomes our variable which contains the um, the data that we've loaded, all right? So let's check, let's check the the shape of it. So we have um, 768, all right? 768 rows with nine columns, okay? We have 768 rows with nine columns. We dealt with this data set I mean, last week, which is the same data set. So if we see the first five rows by using the head, you can see that we have something like this. We have something like this. So we have the pregnancy test, the plasma, the blood pressure, the skin thickness, the test that I made, the body mass index, the pedigree, the age, and then the class. The class is actually uh, what we are interested in and what we are going to predict. All right, so it's, as I said, in this case, we have either one or zero. All right, so what this um, data set is about is um, whether these people are having um, um, diabetes, all right, whether the person is having diabetes or not having diabetes, okay? Whether the person is having diabetes or not ha having diabetes. And finally, when we build the algorithm, we want the algorithm to be able to, um, classify classify a patient as having diabetes or not having diabetes. So this becomes a classification problem, okay? This becomes a classification problem. And for classification problem, we can use um, classification algorithm to do that, all right? So we use classification algorithm to do that. And in this problem statement, in particular, we are going to use the naive base, right? And as I said, the naive base, it's actually um, that we they have I mean different different one. Let me let me just show you here. If you go to the documentary and then you scroll down a bit, you can see that there's a Gaussian naive base. All right, there's Gaussian naive base. Let me get rid of this. Yeah, there's Gaussian naive base. There's multinomial naive base. There's um, complement naive base. There's also um, Benoli naive base. The categorical naive base, but all of them, right? All of them, we use the Gaussian, right? We use Gaussian simply because Gaussian will help us to actually find. Let me get rid of this. Will actually help us to use the normal distribution, right? We can use the normal distribution, and with the normal distribution, we can easily find the mean, right? We can easily find the mean, and then the standard deviation, right? Which is, I mean, used by the Gaussian and I mean, this is it's quite easier to use compared to the others, 
All right, so most people prefer using the Gaussian is more popular than any of the others that you can find over here. All right, so most of the machine learning algorithms that you will see out there, even I mean, in the real life scenario, it is mostly Gaussian. All right, and that's what we will also use in this, in this project. Okay. So uh, moving on, we can also check if there are any now values in there, right? By using the, um, where is my pick? Yeah, by using the is now, right? By using the is now, we can see if there are any now values in there and then we check to see if there's any. Otherwise, if we don't use that and uh, we just do this, we'll be having some true or false over here, right? We have some true or false, which will be difficult to go through all of them. All right, that's why we use the um, is any right. We check the values, and if there's any of that, then um, we can easily we can easily get a summary of it. So false represent that there's no there's no null values in there. All right, so. Um, Mm, let's see this part. Let's try and then see the histogram of all of them. Let me zoom in. Let me zoom out a bit so that we can have a view of all of them. So this represents the distribution of all the columns that we have over here. All right, this represents the distribution of all of them. And um, you can see some of them are um, some of them are skewed, while others are almost almost like a normal distribution, right? Like the plasma, for instance, is having a bit of normal distribution where the preg is having a bit of um, positively skewed, all right? And um, if you, yeah, most of them like like that, like that. And then uh, this normal, normal, this one with some spark at zero, there will be a lot of zeros in there for skin. And then for tests also like that, okay? So let's see from, let me get rid of this. Let's see some correlation between them. Now, if we see the correlation being plotted here, let me zoom out a bit. Okay, now, uh, as I said, the diagonals are always going to be one, all right? The diagonals are always one, so you don't need to worry yourself about it. It's always um, the correlation of, of um, an attribute and itself. So you don't need to worry about your, I mean, about it, just this and that, okay? So what you need to start doing is this and then that, this and then that, and then see the correlation, all right? So if we pick, say, a pregnancy and say a test, you can see the seven negative correlation here, all right? If we check, uh, let's pick any, any, any one, let's say the age, the age and then um, the age and say the class right somewhere here, somewhere here, right? It's having positive correlation, but it's very less, all right? It's having positive correlation, age and class are having positive correlation, but it's very less, all right? Very, very less positive correlation. So what we can do is actually um, plot a heat map for this so that we can actually see Sorry, so that we can actually see it better. All right, let me zoom out. Okay, so now if you see this one here, right, if we, this one, this is just the same correlation, right? It's just the same correlation. If you can, let me highlight this part so that you see what we drew over there. If you see this, right, this is just the same correlation that you can see df.call over there. Right, it's just the same correlation that we drew over there. We, I mean, added over there to plot this um, heat map. Okay, so now if you see the heat map, right, you can see that if you see the bar over here, the bar is telling us that if um, if the color is yellow, if the color is yellow, then um, the correlation is high. So if you can see the diagonals, we see that one, 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 one. That's the highest correlation you can have. All right. And if the color is blue, like very, very deep, and then the correlation is zero or I mean less than zero, all right? So if you can see those like negative here, you can see the negative over here is having negative 0 0.11, right? And the bar is saying that going, I mean, down after zero is very, very deep, all right? So we can actually just have a visual 
uh, representation of this correlation that you plotted over here, right? So that's a better way of seeing it. And um, if there's, there's very, very high correlation, I mean, among the data sets that you need to actually do something about, otherwise you might face something called the multicoloniality, which is very bad, which, I mean, if you build algorithm on it, you're going to have a false prediction. So if you face any issue like that, then you need to deal with it, all right? And um, when we get to PCA, we will deal with something like that and you get to understand it, okay? So we can also plot the pair plot for all of them, all right? Let me zoom out a bit. So the pair plot actually shows us this is the same thing, but in the form of a scatter plot, right? Different, different scatter plots, which compares each of them. All right, so um, for this part, um, my pen, yeah. If you see this one here, this one here is a scatter plot, which shows the correlation between um, plasma and then pregnancy, all right? Shows the correlation between plasma and then pregnancy here. All right, and if you can see, maybe uh, let's pick this one, all right, this one. This is a correlation between um, um, the pressure and then the plasma, all right? I mean, if you can see all of them, actually, all of them are having very, very low um, correlation, all right? We just maybe this one a bit positive correlated, but it's quite less, all right? So this is also another way of seeing your correlation between each of them. And then you can also see the diagonal where we have the kernel density, all right? In the diagonals where you can also see um, how many clusters, I mean, I mean uh, how many classifications that you might actually uh, end up predicting, all right? So if you can see over here, we are having about two peaks over here, telling you something that at the end of the day, you might end up um, predicting two things in there, right? Something like that. Okay, all right. And in this case, it's true because we are going to predict whether the person is having diabetes or not. All right. Um, guys, is the voice breaking? Is it okay? Yeah, um, but I say in the very less correlation. Yeah, very less correlation. There's very, very less correlation in all of these. So um, as I said, we have those with um, um, with diabetes and those with not, um, who are not having diabetes. So we can also check the ratio, all right? And that's what this part of the code is doing. Let me just zoom in here, all right? So we can store those with, um, with diabetes in C and true, all right? And then those without diabetes in something called enforce. It's just variable, just a choice that's um, just a variable that I'm choosing, all right? And here I'm using true and then false. So, I mean, you can use one, you can use one and then zero, all right? You can use one and zero. It's because when you actually run it, it will end up giving you a Boolean output like true or false, all right? which um, represents one or zero, all right? That's why I'm using one or zero, but you can use um, one and then zero. All right, and it will also work for you, okay? And then after that, um, we want to just check how many uh, are having um, diabetes versus those who are not having, all right? So we use the diabetes co um, column, and then we do this division. This is the n true, the number of um, true values that we stored in n true, okay? And we have 268. And those that are false, all right, those that are false, we have 500 of them which are false, all right? And then if we check the percentage of it, that is n true, all right? n true divided by the total, which is n true plus n false, all right? Then we multiply by 100 so that we get it in a percentage form, okay? And then the same thing we, we did for the, I mean, at the n false, all right, which is 500 over here. Okay, then we divide the n force by the total okay? and then multiply it by 100 so that we get it in a percentage form. Okay, so now we can now split our data, right? We can split our data and then start, um, start doing this. So uh, if you remember this part, if you remember this part, um, 
in order to split our data, we will need we will need this. Let me zoom in. Yeah, we will need we will need this package. That's my pen. Yeah, we will need this package called train test split. All right, let me turn off time. Yeah, we will need train test split. Okay, we will need this. And this is what we will use to split our data into training and then testing. Okay, if you see it over here, that's what we are using. All right. Okay, so uh, let me just print the head of this. Let me just print the head of this over here. We have DF. Let me just print the head of this. Okay. So we have our class here, right? We have our class column here. We have our class column here, which is our target. Okay. Now, if you are building the algorithm, right? If you are building the algorithm, what you have to actually do is to separate your data into um, training. I mean, into dependent and then independent. Before you even um, do the train test, right? You have to know that there's different between the dependent variable and then the independent, and then uh, what is called the training test, and then the um, test data set. All right, so let me write it on the screen. So that's, so what I'm saying is that we have what is called the dependent. All right, we have the dependent, and then the independent. Okay, and then after that, we also have, let me put this. We also have what is called a training set. And then the test set or the test set. Okay, so before you even divide your data set into training and testing, right? You have to first divide it into dependent and then dependent. What it's doing is that just separates your target from it. Right, this is our target, just separate it. Separate your target and the rest of the data. All right, just separate your target and then the rest, I mean, from here. So this becomes the dependent and the independent that I'm talking about. Okay, so this is our targets, all right? So this becomes our Y and the whole of this becomes our X. Hello? Yes, hello. Could you please go back to a few uh, previous line of codes where you showed that training and tests, uh, splitting data sets now? Uh, you want me to repeat or you want me to screw up? I just want to uh, see the above line of codes where you have separated the two data sets. I mean, in true and in uh, false in above. I do not understand what you have done at that stage. Okay, let me just do this again. Okay, so you said um, yes. like this one? Yes. You mean this one? Yes, yes. Okay, here, I did not separate anything. I did not do anything here. This one, I just wanted to check the number of true in it or the number of, um, the number of ones in it and the number of zeros in it. So here, I did not separate anything. I did not do anything here. That's why I wrote here that split. And so we are now going to split our data here. But here was just checking. You can even ignore this part completely. Here was just checking. Okay, what this part is actually doing is that there might be a time, if you remember um, our, past, our past class, that you, there might be a- uh, I'm, I, I, missed, I, I missed the last class. Okay, oh, fine. Uh, fine. Yeah, registry regression. So and I didn't understand that. Mm, okay, okay, so let me explain why I did this one. So there's something called um, data imbalance. All right, there's something called data imbalance. All right, so let's say um, in this case we have 268 and then 500, right? Now, if, if let's say we we're having like 1,700 and maybe 72, right? 1,772 zeros. Right, that is those who are not diabetic, right? And then we have C, um, C hundred, right? We have C hundred people who are having diabetes. 
Now, if we build algorithm, right, on this kind of data set, we build algorithm on this kind of data set that is having data which is imbalanced like this, like some of them, one is weighing the other. It's not balanced. I mean, there's a huge gap when you talk about 1,772 and then seven, I mean, 600, right? There's a huge gap here. Now, if you build an algorithm, the algorithm will end up predicting only um, zeros or people with um, no diabetes. Okay, so this this becomes a problem. This is what is called the data imbalance or um, data bias, or there's a several name that you can people give to this kind of problem. And you need to deal with it before you move on. And that's why I check this. Okay. So in, in that line of code, df dot loc. What what is exactly the function for okay. loc? This df dot loc is. Um, I want to pick the class, right? I want to pick the class. Or if you remember, um, our data set is having a lot of um, it's having rows. I mean, a lot of columns, and then we yeah. have the class column also there. Okay, we have others, and then the class column over there. So I want to locate this class, right? I want to oh. locate this class and it's in the column. So if it's oh. in the column, I want to locate it in the column. So I use locate. But okay. if I locate it in the row, then I use I locate so that it will be like go to the index and locate it. But hmm. this is in the column, so go to just go to, to the column and locate the class and pick it for me. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So um so as I said, you first need to separate your data into dependent and independent. And then after that, you can now continue with um, training and then testing data. Okay, so that is what this part is actually doing. Okay, now you see we have over here, right? Let me bring the pen again. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so instead of maybe selecting like here, right, we could have say X and then we select all of them, right? We could have, instead of, so let me just type that so that you see, get rid of the pen. Yeah, instead of this, I'll bring it back. So don't worry, I'll bring this part back. So instead of this, we could have written something like this. All right, and then start picking every, every, every column here, right? Start picking every column here, which will work the same way. All right, start picking every column here. Oh, come on. Okay, start picking all of them there. Then we pick the next one. Like we will do all this for all of them, right? We'll pick everything. We'll pick everything over here. But just imagine if we have about 50 rows, right? We have about 50 rows. How do we do this by hand like that? I mean, it becomes tedious, okay? It becomes tedious doing like, even doing it right now, I feel lazy doing it, okay? And I've never done this, picking it one by one like this, no. I've never done that, okay? But this data set is quite small, so we can easily see it and then pick it. But if we have about 30, I mean, th about 30 columns, it becomes difficult to do that. So what we are going to do here and then put in the X, right? As I said, we first want to um, separate the data into um, dependent and then independent. So all this column, right, from here, all the way to here becomes X, right? All this becomes X. I mean, index is not part actually. So this, all this becomes X and then only this part, right only this part becomes our targets which is y all right that becomes this so this becomes our y here um, this this y all right and all of this becomes this x that i'm selecting okay but if the data set is quite big i will not have the time to be doing all this stuff okay so what i will do is that i will just drop this class from it and then store the rest in x that's what that part is doing. Okay, I'll just drop the class from it. And then the rest, if you drop the class, then the rest will be become X. 
okay? And then the at ASX equals one here is just showing that um, this is found in the column. If you use axis equals zero, then it means that it's found in the row, but in, in this case, you can see it's in the column. So we use axis equals one. And then uh, we also select the class, which is the dependent variable into Y, all right? Then after that, we can use this function, which is the train test splits, all right? We can use that and then we use it to split it, okay? So those, those that will go into, I mean, those X, uh, among the yes. X, yeah. So this is the actual data, right? Means uh, we have to predict the data based on the actual data. Okay, yes. this, mm, let, me, let me hear your question. Uh, I means here, the data set, is, data set is already given where class column is present. Yeah. Now, now when I'll be given the data set, for any project, mm. is there will be class data, the class column, or not? Not mm. means uh, if there okay. Is so okay, so in this project, right? I mean, in this particular one, in this particular data set, we have something we want to predict. Okay, yeah. we have a target here. So this becomes something we call the supervise. So this is a supervised problem. So you first identify what kind of problem am I dealing with? Do I have any target here? If you see in your data sets and you have a target, right, then you see that you are dealing with supervised learning, right? Supervised machine learning. Okay, you are dealing with supervised machine learning. You have something that you're going to supervise. But if you have nothing over there, you have nothing to predict. It means that the company just wants something, some algorithm, some model. Right, you need to just build some model that based on that model, when they have any other data, they can use that model to use it. So in that case, I mean, you'll be having unsupervised, right? You have nothing to supervise. It becomes no target, you have no target. So in that case, you build an algorithm and you just leave the algorithm there to figure out the new data that will come in. Okay, so if you have no target, that becomes unsupervised machine learning, all right? So if I should show you this, that's why earlier on, that's why earlier on I categorized this here. If you can see over here, I put them into um, supervised and then on supervised machine learning. So that's when you get um, in contact with unsupervised machine learning, you know which algorithms to use to build those um, those model that you you need to do for the company. All right. Okay. So there will be a data set that you'll be having a target like we just worked on, right? Like maybe just like the class, right? And then there will be a data set with no target, right? In this case, there will be no target for you, right? There will be no class, as you see, or no targets, there will be no target for you. Okay. Yeah, so that becomes unsupervised. And in that case, you need to figure out which algorithm you need to use. And basically it's not going to be any one of these. It's going to be maybe a combination of um, a, a multiple of these, right? And some of them which are not even here, right? Which we will, we will get introduced to later on. So actually you first need to identify whether your problem is supervised or it is unsupervised. And then you know which one to use. And if it is supervised, is it linear or is classification problem? Okay. So here here we can see that for supervised learning also we can use the classification and for unsupervised also we can use the class this is a clustering model. this is a different technique so what is exactly the logistic regression classification you have told that for the stock exchange data we can use the linear regression and okay. I, I really do not understand where i can use the naive bias classifier and the rest of the like logistic regression. Okay. that's why that's why i said that in, in building machine learning algorithm, right? The, uh, the algorithms that you have, the logistic and the naive base, right? They are not restricted to a particular problem. If you have the problem, like the problem that we are working on right now, we can also use, um, we, can, we are using naive base classifier here, right? We can also use the KNN to do the same thing and then compare these two algorithms and then see which one is performing better. After that, we will use the, I mean, the, the accuracy score, we'll check the accuracy score of, of I mean, either of these, right? And then see which one is performing better and then we choose that particular algorithm. So the problem will come, but you're not going to use 
I mean, just one, just maybe logistic only, or maybe linear only. I have, I have one that I'm, I'm, I'm working on right now, and I'm, I'm combining logistic with um, decision tree to do that. Okay, I'm combining logistic and decision tree to do that. Then after that, um, later on, I even use uh, a different, different one which we will, we will talk about. We, will, I also use that one. Then I also build a different um, classification report to see all of them before even choosing a particular model, which I, I prefer, which is, I mean, actually performing better. All right, so it's not that you have the problem and you have to actually use one of them, okay? You need to use uh, maybe logistic and then linear together in a particular problem and then check which one is doing better. Okay. So if you check, maybe um, logistic is performing better, you ignore this one. All right, and then maybe um, in our case, we can also use the KNN. And if it's performing better than N um, naive base, then we choose KNN, right? And if naive base is performing better, then we use um, we choose naive base instead of KNN. Now, what what actually makes one perform better than the other is that they all have what is called hyperparameters, right? They have something they call hyperparameter. In any of them, you you see uh, maybe use use um, particular algorithm like. Um, oh. Let me see if we have or maybe use this. Let me go here and see. I'm trying to find where maybe I use more than one algorithm and then I can show you that. Okay. Yeah, now let's see this, let's see this one here. Let me go up a bit, up a bit. Yeah, now see, see what I'm doing over here. This is a problem, right? This is a particular problem that I'm working on. Now you can see that I'm using logistic regression here. All right. If you come here, right? So now this problem is not actually, it's not actually a classification problem and it's not regression problem. It's just a combination of two. A problem can come like that, that you might need to combine algorithms and do it. Okay. So now you can see that I'm using, um, um, K neighbors classifier here. This is a classification algorithm which I'm still using over here. Okay, now you can see over here. All right, this is this uh, the one, and then you can see right SVC right support vector um, classifier. Right, this is coming from the support vector machine. Okay, and then you can see that I'm using decision tree also. Okay, if you come here, you can see that I'm using random forest. So this is kind of a complex problem that you need to test several algorithms. You can see that I'm using Gaussian NB, right? You can see that I'm using SGBoost here. Okay, you can see that I'm using SGBoost also here. You can see that I'm using gradient boosting classifier here, okay? And then um, I'm checking the matrix of all of them, all right? I'm checking the matrix of all of them and how each of them is doing, all right? I'm just comparing all of them over here you can see what I'm doing over here. Then after that, I will know which one to choose. Okay, so when the problem statement comes, it depends on how the problem will actually come and um, the kind of problem that you are working on. It's not that you're going to use a particular one or something like that, but the first thing is um, audio lost. Um, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, Sanjay, I don't know, but Sanjay said audio lost. Sanjay, can now you hear me? Yeah, now you're audible. Okay, right, all right. So um, should I repeat what I said or it's okay? It's okay, it's okay, no worries. Okay, fine, okay. So um, that's why what I'm doing is that I just want to introduce you to each of them because if I put all of them together as once, like the one I just showed you, you might get confused, all right? But if you get the taste of all of them, then you can put them together. When you get a problem statement, you can just put them together and then you know what to do. All right. 
So um, over here, as I said, I was just checking to see if there's, if there's uh, any class imbalance or data bias here. All right. So uh, if I can go up, yeah, here is where you actually need to divide it into dependent and then independent. The thing is that when you do these things for um, about three or four projects, you begin to automatically know what to do. And when you get to any step, you need to know what to do. All right. Here, there's some things that I skipped over here, right? Because we've done, we've done them in previous classes, like maybe checking for outliers and stuff like that. You could have also done that and see what happens. Right, or maybe scaling the data and things like that. You could have also done that in, in real life uh, problem. You need to do all those things at the team, right? Or model, uh, there's something called model um, verification team, right? They can also come and then they will be asking you from code to code. I mean, from whatever you've written and whatever step you've taken, right? For instance, if you are building this model for healthcare, right? There's this healthcare one that I did for a certain uh, company in the US, it was about five hours of auditing, right? Every single thing, like even the X train, it's not that they don't know, but why are you using X train? Why do you want to use X test? Why do you want to divide it into this form? Why do you like a lot of questions? I mean, if you meet those those guys, you need to actually know what you're doing. That's why I last week I told you something about pipeline, right? Building pipeline because if you actually like what I'm doing right now, right? Or, and the one that I showed you, I have a lot of algorithms that I'm using. Now, if they ask me to change the algorithm and then run it with different one, uh, it will mess everything that I've done. And you might end up getting stuck somewhere that you might forget something or something like that. And then you run and the code is not running anymore. Something maybe you've done for maybe a week or two or three, right? And then all the team team comes you sit there in front of them and then you run the code and it's not even running because they ask you to change something, you change it and nothing is working anymore. But if you build the pipeline, right, you can easily run through it without causing that kind of trouble. Okay. So like recently, if you're going for an interview, they actually ask for that if you know how to build pipelines and stuff like that. Okay. So let's, let's continue enough of the diversion. So here, what we are doing is the um, here becomes our independent and this becomes our dependent, right? What we want to predict, okay? And then over here, over here we separate it or we just pull it into training and then testing, okay? So this becomes X train and then the X test, just like whatever is in X, right? Some will go into training and some will go into testing. So those who, that will go into training will be named as X train, will be stored in X train. And those who will be go into testing will go into S test, okay? And some, I mean, some of the data that are in Y, which is our target, right? Some will be used for training and some will be used for testing, okay? And they will be stored in here. So we split the X and then the Y, right, data. And then this splitting will be stored in these variables that we give it. So if we split X here, right we will split it into training and then testing so the training one right will be stored in x train and the testing one will be stored in x test and then we will split the y and then the training one will go into y train and the testing one will be stored in y test and then we are we are splitting it into um 70 30 all right so this one is just um it's just your own intuition that you use to split it so it could be 80 20 70, 30, or maybe um, 75, 15, or something like that, according to you. If you do that, and maybe your performance is getting low, if you run the algorithm and it's getting low, you can come and then adjust it. So this is one of what we call the hyperparameter, something you can change. Some of the parameters you cannot change, but some of them you can change. Like this one, you can easily change it according to you. And then the random state is for us to actually generate like this one, this splitting will be done randomly. These numbers will be picked randomly and then stored in this, right? So we want to pick um, the same random numbers when we run the code, right? And that's why we set the random state to be one. Or oh, to be any, it could be any number after all, right? And then if we check, uh, if we pick say um, the S train, right? 
if we pick the S string, just see what is stored in S string, right? We can see that we have some here. The target is not here. We are going to use the, this one for training. So we don't need the target. We don't need the model to see what we want to predict, right? Because the data that will be coming, your model will not know. So we want something to test the model. That's why we keep some for testing. So we don't want it to know. So if you can see here, there's no class here. All right, and these are just random um, random rows or random data points. So we can see it picked eight, eight, then to 460, uh, 467, then 550, just random, 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 right? So if, if uh, maybe I can check the S test too. All right, let me just check the S test so that you can also see what is stored in S test. So let me check the head of it. You can see this one is also um, some randomness that is being put over here, all right? So um, uh, what it's doing here, let's see. Okay, okay, so this part is actually just checking um, we said 70-30, right, 70-30, so you can see 69.92, like just 70 almost, and then 30% for testing, okay, that's what um, we check here, this is the same thing as we did earlier on when we're doing um, this, okay, it's just the same, the same way, All right, picking the training, dividing it by the total, multiply by 100, picking the testing, dividing it by the total, multiply by 100. All right. Okay. So this this is just some 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 other stuff that I did, but you can just run it if you get it. You can just run it and then you just see. It's just checking um how many is in training, how many is in testing, how many are true and how many are false. Just checking for all of them for training and testing. All right. So if you get it, you can just run it over here and then you see. So uh, we can also check, we can also check if there are any missing values here. Now, this is one of the um, tricky parts of um, data set coming in because basically you will not be the one to collect the data, right? You will not be the one to collect the data. So the data will come and you need to figure it out. All right, the data will come and you need to figure it out. Now, if the data comes like this, all right, Normally, if you check, like uh, if you see up here, we check if there are any null values in there. Yeah, and then it said false, right? There are no null values in there. Okay, there are no null values in there. Maybe I can, so, uh, let me see if this one will work. Yeah, you see there are no null values in there, all right? So maybe that is actually telling you that um, there's no null values, right? But the thing is, Python recognizes null values in a different way, right? If um, it's NAN, then it can easily identify, right? Otherwise, it becomes difficult for it to identify it. And people collecting the data also have a different way of representing null values, all right? Some can actually, those who want to work on, on the data after collecting the data can actually use NAN so that they can easily work on it, right? But if the person is not the one going to work on it or doesn't actually care about whatever, uh, who, who is going to work on the data or how they work on it, right? They choose different way of representing null values or data which is not available, all right? So in this case, like the testing, right? When they're doing the test, if you can see, there are some um, zeros in there, all right? There are some zeros in there. Now you need to actually be very, very cautious when you're doing this, right? This could be a valid zero or it could be a false um, zero, all right? So if you are a bit confused about whether zero is actually not supposed to be zero, maybe the data was not available or they had nothing to test, so they put zero there, all right? Then you need to verify from your data source who is whosoever is giving you the data you need to verify from there all right and um if if maybe you use your own intuition and you remove this you remove this data i mean this is going to cause a problem but if it's actually a, a null value and you don't remove or you don't deal with it it's also going to cause a problem all right so you need to be 
very, very careful when you're dealing with something like this. All right. So if this one was like uh, previously we dealt with, if you remember, there was the person representing our value with question mark. All right. Then, I mean, that can be easily identified that, okay, the data was not available and the person represented with question mark. Then we can easily deal with it. But in this case, it is zero. The person put a zero there. Now we have to be cautious whether this zero is zero. All right. So now testing the person, right? If we test the person, you now you can, one thing that can help you, you look at the variation in the data. Now you can see 100 and 100. And let me just, instead of printing the head, right? Let me print everything so that we can actually see. Yeah, let me run this. Okay, now if we see if we see this train, right? Um, this test, yeah, the test rather. We see the test. If you see the values, right? We have one, one hundred and ten, hundred, one fifty. Like they are very, very huge, right? So it's it's actually very difficult for this test, right? That's why I said you have to actually verify from the source, right? But if you are using your own intuition, then you have to actually maybe consider it in that way. You have maybe from 158, something like that, all the way to zero. I mean, it's, it's actually suspicious, right? So this makes it zero suspicious. Maybe if it is around um, 60 or 70 or maybe something like that, maybe 50 or something like that, then we could actually understand. But if it's all the way zero, then it makes the zero suspicious. Then um, if you're not getting in contact or you cannot actually get to the source of the data and then get to understand what they meant by zero, then maybe you can use your intuition to get, I mean, deal with this zero. Maybe remove it or maybe replace it with the mean or the median of the color. All right. So that's that's one way of getting it. But the best way is actually to get to the source of the data, who, who is giving you the data, and then ask what they mean by zero. And you can actually, um, get to understand it and know how to deal with it better. So let me just print um, the head of it again. Um, what is it? This, yeah. Okay, so let me run it from here. I think that is something I have to do. Okay, let me run this. And then run this. Good. And then I run this. Okay, good. Now, if you if 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 we consider this zero, right? If we consider this zero as now values, all right, then we have to actually deal with this because this might not be the only zeros. I mean, we are just printing the first five rows, right? We are just printing the first five rows, and there might be a lot of zeros in there. All right, just like if you see the test is also having something like that. All right, even the skin, right? When the skin, I mean, when they test the skin thickness and there was nothing there, they put a zero there. Okay, so we can actually deal with this. All right, we can actually deal with this. Okay, so our splitting was actually giving us this, as we, we said, I'll need to 70, 30, all right? So that's, you see, 69.92, right? Like 70 almost. And then um, over here, right, over here. So what's, what we, we are going to do over here with our, 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 our strategy over here using what is called a simple imputer. This one, you can actually, you can do it by hand, right? But since there's the package in there for you to do, right? You can easily make, uh, take advantage of this package and then use it to do it, right? Something called simple imputer, all right? You can use that and then you use to, um, this, this becomes what you want to use, right? You want to use the mean of, I um, mean, the column, right? So if it will go into, each of the columns and um, if it finds any zero. So what's missing missing value here is zero. So in our previous case, um, the data that we dealt with, it was question mark. So in that case, if we are using simple imputer for that purpose, we would have used question mark here. But in this case, it's zero. So the missing value here, we say that it's zero. So if it sees any zero, 
it will uh, replace it with the mean of that column. All right. Now, if you do that, right, what happens is that you will lose the column. So the best way is to store the column, right? You lose the columns of the, um, I mean, the data frame that you have. We have some columns all the way to age and some stuff, some tests here, some stuff like that. So you will lose that. So we store the column. Right, we store the column so that later we can put the column back. All right, then after that, it becomes actually when you do that, it becomes um, it becomes a series, right? Like each of the columns is a series like that. When you put them together, it becomes a data frame. So after that, we put we just change everything into a data frame. All right, we change everything into a data frame over here. So we do for the X screen and then the edge test. All right. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, across the entire table, uh, we are replacing zeros with mean. Yeah. Uh, what if I want to have uh, uh, only uh, for a couple of uh, row, uh, columns, I will go with a mean and uh, a couple of columns with a uh, median. So how do I do that? You want to replace some with the mean and then some with the median. Yeah. Okay, so if if you want to do that, I mean, you have to also be cautious of inconsistency in what you're doing. Okay, you have to be cautious of inconsistency of what you're doing, and it might affect the total outcome of um, of your model. Okay, it might also affect the total outcome of of your model. You can actually pick each of the columns, and then you do that. Right, you can actually pick each of the columns. Like um, what we did earlier on we, uh, for the question mark. In that case, you can easily uh, pick whatever data that you want to work with. Right, maybe um, you can easily pick that column. Maybe DF, and then you pick that column. All right, but first you have to see. You have to see the maybe the column age something like that. First, you have to see the parameters that are in simple input. Uh, all right, you can check the document and then see the simple imputer and then see maybe um, you can easily do that or otherwise you can just uh, ignore the simple imputer and then you do it, um, you just do it individually just like we did for the question mark. All right, you can also do it individually just like we did for the question mark case. But that's what I said, you have to be cautious because you're using mean and then median. Which, which is two different and all together. So one, one column is going to be um, represented as a median of, um, of replacing um, the zeros, all right? And then the other column is going to be replacing the zeros with um, the mean, which is going to be very, very inconsistent. Remember that I said, if you are using uh, what is called, uh, this, let me bring the pen. We're using what is called the Gaussian you're using what is called the Gaussian NB, right? And in this case, what um, Gaussian NB is approximating is the normal distribution, right? The normal distribution. And what we want to do is to use the standard deviation here and the mean here, okay? The standard deviation and the mean here. All right, so if we are, use, we are going to use some of the columns median and some of them with mean, then there is going to be some inconsistency there, right? And it might affect the performance of the uh, final model. Okay. So you have to be very careful. Um, that's why I said there is something called hyperparameter tuning. Maybe yeah, the, data, the data that you have, right? The data that you have, you can actually do that. And then you check the final performance of it, right? You can maybe um, in doing so, yeah, the best, the best way to do that is divide your data into three. I mean, like what, what we are doing here, we have, we, have, um, we have testing, right? We have training and then we have testing. So if you want to do something like that, right? Then uh, the best way to do that is to add another data, which is called validation. Okay, so before you mess this testing up, right? You can be using this one to test and see what is happening over there. So if we say that uh, you use mean for what, some of the columns, right? And then you use median for some of the columns and then you use the validation test to check and then you see that something is happening, it's not going well, then you can easily go back and then change 
um, change the mean to median or maybe the median to mean so that there will be consistency there. But if you use the validation and it's working well for you, then you can continue. And then finally, you can use the testing and see the performance of it. And if it is working in that way, then it's good. All right. So, I mean, there's no straight way, but you have to be cautious. Otherwise, you might have um, some bias model at the end of the day, which might work so well on, I mean, maybe the test, even on the testing data, it might work very well, right? But when new data comes in, which is fresh, we doesn't know anything here, right? There might be very, very poor performance, right? Which, I mean, we just call them uh, overfitting. Right, so you just, you just, in that case, you can just use the validation tests also, so that you will not end up spending a lot of time doing a lot of work and then finally you find out that your model is not actually performing, All right? But that being said, that could also help depending on the data set that you're having. Maybe the data is actually skewed, very, very skewed, right? Is very, very skewed, then uh, maybe the median will actually work for that particular um, color. Maybe the age part is very, very skewed, then um, the mean, I mean, the median will actually work, all right, will actually work for that particular column. All right. Uh, well, just can you show the data once, once again? Hmm? Can you show the data once again, the, the head of the data? Okay. Uh, so sometimes what if the, the uh, value of zero is uh, correct? When, when uh, yeah, probably sometimes zero is valid. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. You have to be very cautious when you're dealing with these zeros. Very, very cautious when you're dealing with the, the zeros. If you're assuming that the zero is actually not correct, right? You have to actually know, I mean, get in, in, in contact with the source of the data. Maybe this data is coming from a client that you are working for or a company that you are working for. Then you as a data scientist, they brought this data, all right? Then you have to actually consult them, whoever brought the data or whatever you, they got the data from. And then you got to understand what this zero means, okay? Because this might be a valid, it might be a valid input here. And if you remove it, you mess up the whole thing. I mean, the whole thing that you do moving on from here will be wrong. Okay, so you have to be very, very careful in dealing with something like this. But if it's something like, um, like in our previous case, it was question mark, it's easy to identify and then get rid of it. Or maybe it's represented with NAN, which maybe it might be someone who really knows how to represent this, then that might be easier to use. But if it is zero, you have to be very, very cautious. It's because in this kind of data set, right, in this Pima, um, blah, 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 Pima Indian diabetes data set, right? Um, whoever, uh, whoever collected this data represented it with this, and on Kaggle, they actually explained that zero is actually a missing, represents a, a missing um, data, all right? So zero actually was a missing data in this kind of data set. That's why we are dealing with it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have touched it until we get clarification. All right, but for this Pima Indian um, data sets, which was in, I mean, which is still in, in cargo, it's actually represented, zero is actually represented as a now or a missing data. That's why we are dealing with it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have, unless we get clarification for where the data is coming from. Or uh, we can actually, as I said, use our intuition and um, later on, if we see the performance of a model, we can actually get to know or maybe come back, put it back, and then start doing the same thing we are doing again and then compare. All right. Okay, can we, can we move on? Uh, how to create validation test? How to? The training, we have split training and testing. Test yeah, yeah. And how to create validation test? Okay, like uh, over here, I did, I did, um, what is it? Okay, over here, I use only training and then test, right? Yeah, so I can use maybe um, S train, S test, maybe M. 
You can also do m uh, underscore train. All right, then I can also do m underscore test. So I'll be using this one. I'll be using this one, right? I'll be using this this m that I've created here for validation. Okay. Okay. Uh, but how much is the percentage? Because here the test we have mentioned thirty percent. Yeah, yeah. In that case, in that case, you we also have to, I mean, specify. Um, or you can, we can. Uh, I mean, you can use the default by changing this. All right, you can use the default so that it will actually um, by default do that for you. Okay, so we are like in this case, if I want to use validation, right? I normally use default. Right, I normally use defaults and then uh, I will not worry about what percentage is going where and what percentage is going where. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If if we like um, next week, we can also do some like instead of maybe doing training testing, we can also do that. We can also okay. do that. Yeah, I have I have another one that's um, that's why I not even do it in this case. I just only use um, X train like I was not even having this. I use S train, then I use um, let me clear all this. Then I use Y test. Right, I only use this one to do it because I, I I was just checking a quick check to see how the things will work. So I was just using only S train and then Y test to work with. All right, so there's there's different way of doing it. I mean, it's not that strict. What, what you can actually do is, if you want to use it, you can actually um, even get rid of this S train S test, right? Just get rid of it. And then manually, you can select whatever you want to select. Maybe S train because, and then um, over here, right? In DF, you can, in DF, you can actually select uh, maybe on, uh, from X, all right? So let me just maybe use X instead of using DF. I can, in X, right? In X, I can just select any of them. Maybe um, select any of the columns in X, right? Maybe I can select pregnancy plus um, the, the skin or the test, right? Then I'll shuffle through that. I can just write a simple function or just do that. Just um, make it a list of that and then select all of them. So let's the column that I want, all right, select some of the columns that I want over here. And then um, I'll just specify how many, I guess, how many data points, I mean, how many rows that I want, all right? Then manually, I can just do that, okay? Then after that, um, down here, I can also use Y, right? I can use maybe Y train here. And then in Y, right, also you got to, in Y over here, I can just select different, different, um, I mean, rows, then I can also use it. Then maybe I can use, I can come here and then um, the one I want to use to test. So I can do this manually to uh, get some, mod, I mean, validation data sets and some testing data sets manually also to work with. Okay, you can actually do that by hand, and then just select some of the some of the columns and some of the rows to work with, All right? And then finally, if everything is working well for you, you get you actually if you just even do a manual work, a quick work like this, right? You can easily get to get to know which one is working and which one is not working, and you can easily come and then. Um, start to build it again and maybe some of some of the column are not even necessary to add all right you can even drop some of them if they are not actually necessary to add you can even drop some of them all right okay let me do this so that when you get the notebook you can actually get what was there all right uh, I have one more question. What? Uh, what did you say? I did not actually get you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. 
Yeah, I did not get your question. Can you repeat? Uh, now I got the con uh, you know, confirmation on train test plate, and I have one more question on the uh, target variable called class. Yeah. There we have a um, two uh, categories. Uh, one is true or false. Mm. What if I have a, a, a target variable uh, with uh, a string values having multiple classes, mm. uh, say around mm. five to ten? In that mm. case, uh, can I go with a logistic regression, or, or is there any other model is available? Okay, like um, if I understand your, let me bring my pen. If I understand your question correctly, you say that we have this, right? We have the class. And in this case, we have um, we have one, and then we have zero, right? Which we are trying to predict. So um, your question is, what if we have maybe one, and then zero, maybe two, maybe three, like different, different, right? Maybe like a product rating like if, that. If I'm very correct, if the numbers are not there, and I only okay, string maybe out. Maybe this one is say one. Maybe this one is zero. Yes. Maybe this one is two. Okay, so uh, what you can do is actually you can use something they call the label encoder, right? Then you can label it, maybe one represents one, and then the zero represents zero, right? You can use the label encoder to do that. There's a package like that, or manually you can do that. Maybe uh, you just specify that in DF, our data is stored in DF, right? So you can specify that in DF, right? If you come into contact with, I mean, um, this is supposed to be this square bracket, all right? And then you bring what is called this, um, like you are, you are creating a dictionary, right? So when you encounter zero, right? Zero will be something like this, then you, zero is in, all right? Then semicolon will be here. And then when you encounter zero, replace it with zero. Okay, then you bring your command. Then you do the same thing when you encounter um, one, you replace it with one. Okay, you do that also for two. When you encounter two, you replace it with two. Or maybe I can just type it so that you can see it clearly. Let me just try and type it so that you see it. No, I, I, I got it. Okay. I got it. So my problem is that um, what if my class variable, no, I think that not the class, it is cities of having uh, 10 cities. Hmm. If I label include it for two, one to uh, 10, yeah. take, take the one to 10. So yeah. uh, how my model will assume that, you know, uh, one is less than two, two is less than three. Yeah, if you use, if you use um, what I call um, label encoding, right? It actually labels it. So this label, this, um, where's my pen? This, um, this is zero equals one, right? This one will not be ranked. Okay. Okay. This one will not be ranked. One like maybe one, two, three, where two is greater than one and three is greater than three. This, if you say um, zero and then one equals say one, I mean zero equals zero. Actually, one equals C one, right? This will not be ranked, right? There's there's another one called one hot encoding, right? In one hot encoding, it will actually also create different columns for each of them. Maybe zero, zero will have its own column also. One will also have its own column also, so that it will not be in one column so that it will get to rank. So when we use um, those packages, these numbers will not be ranked. So it will not be as uh, humans, as we humans see it as rank numbers, right? Where maybe four will be greater than three, three is greater than two. No, it will not see it like that, All right? Maybe your target is maybe um, America, maybe America, right? And maybe um, India, maybe um, Russia or something like that. And then you want to change this America to say one because you cannot build the algorithm of America. You can you have to change it. And then maybe India equals two, maybe Russia equals three. All right. If you do it like this, the algorithm will understand that these things are not ranked. All right. For example, if you use the one hot encoder, it will create columns for each. It will create columns for America, 
all right where america will be um if 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 say um here is one right for america all right then here will be one if here is say zero which represents say india then uh, here will be zero and zero and then zero and then when it gets to india column where india was one india will be represented with one all right then the rest will be zero and then when it gets to russia where russia was one will be one and the rest will be zero so it's also it, this one hot encoding you can also do it like this if you use label encoder it will also make it understand that this one is not ranked right it will take the ranking out of it okay in that case my target variable are uh, multiple classes yeah yeah your target variable is like um it's like whether whatever you're predicting is in america or is in india or is in russia or something like that so you are classifying whether um maybe something is in in america or that thing is in india or that thing is in russia that's why I'm saying that it can be more than two. Like I said, A, it could be A or B, right? It could be A, B, or C, or D, right? Whatever you're trying to classify could be one or more, right? Because I've used a label encoding uh, for my class variable with the cities. Uh, I'm unable to get a uh, higher accuracy using a logistic regression. So what other model I can, uh, I, I can try? Okay, like, is there any any other one that you can try? Yep. Okay, because maybe you model can in place. try the one hot encoding. Okay. Yeah, you can try the one hot. One hot is another another one that you can actually use. One hot encoding, which will encode everything as a go. But uh, normally, um, if you use Label encoding. This actually the ranking takes off, right? We take off the ranking, so there will be no ranking in. So um, it will not actually have uh, impact on your what do you call it? Your final model. Maybe there's there's some other hyperparameters you have to tune instead of um, this this encoding. Once you use the label encoder to encode it, it's okay. That has been the ranking has been taken care of. Can I go for ordinal encoder? Yeah, you can also use that. You can also use that. Okay, okay. You can also use okay. that. Yep, thanks. Okay, all right. So um, let me see where we were. Okay, somewhere here. Okay, so as I said, um, if we are doing if we are doing this right, we are replacing zero with mean, right? This is zero with mean. Then what will happen is that we will lose the the columns, right? That's why finally we will come back and then put the columns there. So we store, we try and then store the columns in what is called the course. Course is just a variable that I define, right? It could be anything, maybe um B B O G G G something like that. It could be any variable. I'm just storing it in what is called course, right? Just making the name familiar with what I am storing i'm storing the columns in that all right then after that i just put everything into um data frame now let me show you what happens if you do that okay if you do that you see what happens over here um because i run this again let me try and do this yeah i have not run this but okay so let me run this yeah, now you can see after replacing the mean, I mean, using the simple imputer, right? And replacing the zeros with the mean. Now you see that we, we lost we lost the, the column names over here. Okay, we lost the column names. So what we can do over here is to put it back, right? If you see the test also, right? The test is also the same thing. The column names are lost. All right, the column names are lost. So we can put the column names back, okay? We can put it back. So now if we put it back and then we check the head again, we can see that it's there. All right, now we have it again. That's why we store the column at, I mean, at the initial stage, okay? 
So now we can proceed to start with our naive base, right? And as I said, the Gaussian is most popular for all the um, naive base, different naive base that you can actually use, right? The likes of complementary, the Bernoulli, and uh, categorical, and all the others that you can think of. The, uh, the Gaussian is most popular, right? Simply because of the normal distribution that it assumes and they help us to get the mean and the standard deviation easily. So we're going to use that, all right? And then um, we initialize it over here, all right? So this is the model that we're going to build, all right? Model underscore, right? You can even take the underscore off. I just put it there because I've already done some on, uh, model in the, in the same Jupyter notebook. So I just differentiate it. All right, so we are going to use model.fit, all right, to, so this is where our machine learns, all right? So our machine is going to learn, and learning from where, from the X train and then the Y train, all right? Learning from this, and then um, the dot travel. <laughs> Okay, we can actually do this prediction, all right, use it to make predictions and then um, store it in a different variable or even if we get rid of this, it can still do the predictions for us, it's not necessary. I just store it here so that later I can actually um, compare it. So let me get, get it back, all right. So if you can see here, right, um, we are predicting zero or one. All right, zero or one. So if we can see the final predicting uh, predictions here, we can see that we have some ones and we have some zeros. All right, that's what the model is doing. We are not much concerned about whatever is output here. What we are concerned is the accuracy of the model. How well is our model is able, able to I mean, predict? And if you see over here, this prediction is being done on the X train. All right, this is the data that the model has already learned from it, has already known this data. All right, so if you're using maybe um, validation, right, this this could be something like a validation because here I did not do um, testing and validation. So I'm still using the X train as a validation, right? Before finally I'll test it here, right? Before finally I'll go and then test it on the, I mean, uh, let me do it over here. I'll test it on the S test, which the model has not learned from, right? So this is our testing. So I'm just using this, this training here as a validation data, all right? And if I check, if I check the accuracy score of the model, this, is, this, this accuracy score is on, uh, on the training, right? It's coming from what our model is able to predict on the, based on the training data, okay? Based on the training data. And we're having about 74%, all right? About 74%. So if we do that, sorry, if we do that on uh, on the testing data, right? If we do the same prediction on the testing data, right? On the testing, this is the data that our algorithm has not seen. Okay, now this is the predictions that is coming up. All right, this is the prediction that is coming up. So we can also check the accuracy of it. And then we can see that this one is making 77%. All right, it's performing better, on, better than um, when we did for the training data or the validation. Right. So, um, actually, our model is actually doing well. If your model is performing better on the testing data, then it's doing well. All right. But if your uh, model is performing better on maybe when I use the training data and I got higher accuracy, and then over here I got lower accuracy, then I know that um, my model is overfitting. Right. It's overfitting. It has, it has learned so much from the training data and it's not able to. I mean, perform well on the unseen data, all right? What we want to build is an, as a model that can generalize, a model that can work on different data sets that will come in, the data that it has never seen, all right? So this is, the S-test is the data that it did not learn from. So if I use that to make the prediction and it's working and it's, I mean, predicting it's having higher accuracy than um, what I did over here, then I can see that it's actually doing well, all right? Although, I mean, no, overall, 77 is a bit low, but uh, if it's health healthcare, then this will not work, right? In healthcare, it's supposed to be um, at, at least 98 point something, all right? Or, I mean, better should be 99 point something, 
all right but i mean maybe somewhere in e-commerce or something like that if you're building um, a model in some way in e-commerce or something like that then you can go with it and then um, try to test and then see and then readjust to the model again but in the health sector you cannot do that you cannot do try and error there and the same thing if you are building it in the banking sector you cannot do the try and error there it has to you need to get have very higher accuracy from 90 95 and above all right you need to get really really high accuracy okay but in in e-commerce you can test you can test a model like this and it might actually work perfect for you all right and uh maybe in uh in an in industry like um music recommendation or movie recommendation like the likes of netflix and um amazon prime or something like that if you're building a recommendation system like that then if if it is maybe 77 percent you can see um i can deploy it and then test right i can um, test on it, make, make, make that kind of, um, make room for that. But if it's healthcare or banking, no, they will not accept, they will not accept something like that. It will not work over there because in healthcare, you cannot do try and error. And in banking, it too, you cannot do that. You, you let the company lose money like seriously. Okay. So we can also check, um, what is called the confusion matrix over here. So here you can see that, um, those that are one, right, that we're supposed to. So the black one represent the ones that we actually predicted wrongly. And uh, you need to actually um, see, you need to actually focus on that and see how many, I mean, how many ones you predicted wrongly and how many ones were right and how many zeros you predicted right and how many zeros you predicted I mean, wrongly. All right. So if you if you if you use this one, I mean, this is a visual way of seeing what you what your performance is actually doing. So you can see that the wrong is actually very very high, and you need to do some some tuning to rerun this algorithm again and reduce this. All right. So if it's healthcare, this is totally going to be rejected. But if it's e-commerce sector, um, we can actually give a room to it and then run it for maybe a day or two and then see how things go. Right, and then maybe let us try to tune it again and get higher performance, or maybe change the naive base completely and then use different algorithm altogether. All right, like I was doing in the other projects, I have different different algorithm that I run, and then I check each one for I check each each confusion matrix, right, and then see which one is doing better. All right, so we can also we can also do that. Okay, we can also do what is called the classification report. All right, you can also do what is called the classification report and then see the precision and the recall and the F1. I mean, the precision is, I mean, when you consider one, right? When we consider one, how well were we able to, cons I mean, identify one as one and then how well were we able to identify zeros, right? So at 80% of the time, we're able to identify zero, but at 71%, we're able to identify one. Now, when you come to one, right? How well were we able to remember one as one? That's the recall. How well are we able to remember one as one? That is at sixty-five percent. We're able to, I mean, remember. That's our model, right? Our model was able to recall one. Uh, I mean, at sixty-five percent, our model was able to recall one as one, and um, at um, eighty-four percent, our model was able to recall zero as zero. So you can see that zero was actually being re being able to recall in all of the if you consider recall and precision, right? So there's some kind of um, you can think of it as some kind of bias here, right? Our model is actually able to see zero more than it's able to see one, all right? And if you see the F1 score, F1 score is um, the weighted average of precision and recall, all right? And I mean you can even ignore the two of this precision and recall and then focus on the F1, right? The F1 score, which is just the weighted average of precision and recall. And it's showing you that at 67%, you're able to predict one as one, and then our model is able to do well on zero or predict zero as zero at 82% of the time. All right, so maybe, um, maybe with what I check over here, we can go back and then do something, maybe do some up sampling and down sampling here. All right, and then C, all right, and then C, because I um, mean the true which represent one is was only 268, and then the zeros were 500. That's why you can see that we're able to identify more zeros 
as zeros, right? Than more ones as ones. Okay, so you can actually go back here and then do something they call the up sampling and down sampling. Maybe make um, this one generate some synthetic zeros or synthetic ones to make these numbers equal maybe 500, 500 or 680, 600, I mean 268 and 268, something like that. All right, and then you can also build this model again. Okay. So um, we'll, <clears throat> we'll end it here. I mean, earlier on, I plan to also start um, the, um, what is called the K nearest neighbor, but I uh, think it will be good if we, if we end it here and start that in the next class, All right? So that um, you will not get too much, um, how do I say it? You will not get too much stressed out. Uh, any any document uh, for to handle imbalance data of what uh, to imbalance data how to handle the imbalance uh, data okay okay there's there's a package for that called um imp something something like that i think imp um, yeah 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 imblen yeah imblen so if, if you search something called imblen let me see there's a documentation like that and let me see if I can get to the original one in balance log. Okay. Let me see in blend. Okay, let me do in blend Python and see. Yeah, there's there's a documentation like that that you can actually, yeah. So there's this, there's this smooth which will actually generate synthetic data for you, right? And then there's what is called upsampling and downsampling, all right? Some people also call it oversampling. So upsampling is the same as oversampling and downsampling is also called um, the same as, um, I mean, undersampling, all right? So you can read the documentation from here. You can also read the documentation from here. So there's a package called sample which you can use to do that. I think there's one project like that. Um, there's one project like that that we would do. Let me see if I will find, I will find it, I will show you. Let me see something here. Yeah, you see over here, I'm doing something called down sampling, all right? And I'm using what is called resample here. Okay. So there's a package for it. There's a package that you can actually use to do that. So then I'm, I did some um, under sampling, something like that. Let me see what this, this, um, yeah, you can actually import what is called resample to do that. Okay. So if we get time for all this, we can actually do it. But the problem is that um, if if the project that I've given earlier on, right? It depends on how well you will submit it as early as possible so that we can do a lot of them. It's because for projects I have, I have tons of them. I've done a lot of them that I can give. And then we can also do it um, together. If, if we want, we can even schedule a time for that and then we can go through them. All right, so it's, it's cause right now we've, I mean, the web scraping, I've not actually seen much of it. And then the, um, the linear, right? I have the logistic which I've hold on to, I've not uploaded. And then with this naive base, this, even what I gave you earlier on was something that you can easily start with because I did some in class that you can easily look at it and then do it, right? But there are some that, that we've not done in class, but you still have to do it and then you figure things out and you get to know a lot of stuff. But if we do one Google search, what happens is that you get to know about two, three, um, two, three things and add it to what you're searching, all right? So, I mean, 
it's also it will also come from your part the more you do the more we all can do it together all right okay so if um if there's any other question you can add you can ask send it we can close the session here if there's no I, have other. One, I have one question okay uh, how to handle this uh, uh, data leakage how, how we can avoid that is there a methods available to validate or to avoid that data, data leakage okay, to 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 avoid data leakage what you have to do is to do what i said earlier on here um like if you want to what, normally what happens and what actually causes the data leakage is you you do um maybe let me show you my data yeah this one let me zoom in okay this one is a bit okay like we have 15 zero one one thirty six something but even this one there's if if this is a real life problem that i'm doing i'll not actually move on like this i'll actually scale this data before i move on right this is the s green data so what you actually do at first is to do this right this will actually help you to avoid data leakage if you miss this step before scaling your data you're actually going to automatically get into data leakage if if your data is like if your data is i mean not uniform right what what i mean here is let me bring the pen so that like um in this in this data at least is you are even seeing 15 and something like that which is quite um closer to each other but if you can see the pedigree we have 0 0.15 0 0.6 something and then here we have 110 100 and then we have 32 like there are some with high values. There are some with very, very low, right? Very, very low. Okay, there are some with very, very low. Okay, so what happens over here is that, now if um, if you are building an algorithm on this, what's, what algorithm does is use what is called the, um, the Euclidean distance, all right? So what is called the Euclidean distance. Now what it's doing is that it will find the distance between 15 and zero the distance between 136 and then um, 97, the distance between 70 and 64, the distance between 32 and 36. That is what it's doing. So normally what it's doing is this. Um, let, me, let me clear this. What it's doing is the distance between 15 minus zero, and then find the square of that, um, plus the distance between 136 and 97, all right, and find the square of that plus all the way to the last one, which is the distance between um, 43, that is this, the distance between 43 and 25, and then find the square of that. After that, it will find the root of that. This is the distance that it will be calculating for all of them, for all of them, right? The distance between maybe this and that, the distance between one and two, something like that, all of them, for all of them to do that for all of them. Now what happens is that the distance between 136 and 97 will be huge, right? It will be a very high number, right? However, the distance between uh, 15 and zero, or maybe if you do this one, the distance between zero minus one, right? And find the square of that. This will be very, very, very small, all right? So this distance will outweigh all of them, it will outweigh all of them, it will outweigh this, it will outweigh this. So this distance will not matter. So automatically you are ignoring this. Okay, so what happens is that in order to avoid that, what we do is to scale this data, maybe use the Z-score, or, or you can use the standard scaler, which is also a package that you can also use. Right, so you can either use the Z-score or you can use the standard scaler to do that. Now, if you don't divide your data into this four, into X, which is the um, independent variables, and then the Y, right, before scaling. Now, if you are scaling using the Z-score, for example, the Z-score is actually using every number minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Okay, so what is happening is that it will do that for all of the data points. So here maybe the class is also part of it. All right, so it will use the class values and then consider all of them, all the data points in here, right? And then scale it. So at the end of the scaling, you will be having maybe something like between 
maybe zero point something, something, zero point something, something negative, zero point something, something, something like that, all right? So what is actually happening is that scaling it, you use each column to make a decision when you're scaling it, all right? You use each column to make a decision when you're scaling it. After scaling it, if you come and divide it into training and then testing, your, your testing data has already been used to do this scaling, okay? Your, dress, your class column, which is um, your target or your testing, which you separate and then make some of them testing and then training, right? Has already been used in this scaling, okay? So your data will actually learn from it in some way. I mean, your model will learn from it in some way, okay? So what happens is that, I mean, that is what we actually refer to as data leakage. The data has already leaked. The testing data has already leaked, right? You can think of it as an exam question paper where you need to do it at the final, I mean, the final day, and then some students have already seen the question paper, right? So you can think of your model as a student who has already seen the question paper. So it will perform very, very, very well when you test it. Maybe you can get that crazy to 98 or 99%, right? But if you take it to production or to a real world, or maybe you bring a new data set, which is which the data has not seen it, you can get accuracy like 60% or 54%. That's what we call the data leakage. Your data has already leaked. So to avoid that, first do this. All right, first do this before scaling. If you want to scale from this part, maybe you can scale this um, X train, right? You can scale this X train. So before scaling this S train, make sure that you have already done this part. You have already separated it before scaling. But if you scale, if you scale your data set before coming to this part, maybe you scale it up there before coming to this uh, step, right? Then all you're doing is leaking your data. Okay, so first separate it before scaling. That's all, that will help you to avoid the data leakage. Okay. okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, any other question? If you have any other question. Is there any other question which I can answer or can we end the class here? Is someone speaking? Okay, if there's no other question, then uh, we can end the class here. Yeah? All right, thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. So please um, do the project so that we can move on and do the other projects too. Okay. All right. In the next class, uh, which, uh, which algorithm we are learning? Okay. Okay, in the next class, uh, we will be doing um, K nearest neighbor, if I'm right, yeah, we'll be doing K nearest, let me, let me check from here. Yeah, we'll be doing this, KNN. All right, if I, if I don't change my mind, <laughs> we'll be doing that. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, let me stop the recording. Okay, so good night.